person more than once. So a repeated measures design, you're, you're measuring the same person more than once. So the before-after design is one variation of a repeated measures design. We're going to talk about different designs now. Um, first of all, so here are some other repeated measures designs. Again, you're measuring the same people. Okay? So one is called simultaneous measurement. Simultaneous measurement is sort of as it sounds. You're measuring people at the same time. That is, within the same experimental session. Okay? So for example, let's say you're looking at whether people have um, their memory is better for positive words or negative words. So within the same session, you might intersperse positive and negative words, right? That's um, randomly, okay? That is almost simultaneous. So we refer to that as simultaneous presentation, okay? So um, that is one variation of a repeated measures design. You're presenting these two different conditions within the same experimental session. Sometimes you can't do that. Sometimes you can't do that. And if you can't present things simultaneously, what's the other thing you can do? Present them successively. Okay? So that would be successive measurements, one after the other. Again, may still be within the same experimental session, but you present A and then you present B. It's not that A and B are intertwined in some way within the experimental session. Now, there's going to be a problem with that which I'm going to talk about in a few more minutes. We're not going to handle it right now. But there's going to be an essential problem with this successive presentation, right? Because you're presenting things in a particular order. So we'll talk about that. And I wrote up here, needs a counterbalance design for this. We will get to that. <coughs> but those are other different types of repeated measures designs, which I want to get straight the terminology, because this is conceptually very easy but it's kind of easy to get tricked on some of the uh, words. The t-test that we're using, he refers to in the book as a matched t-test. That's the name of the test, is a matched t-test, okay? But then there are different designs, like before-after designs, successive measurement, uh, simultaneous measurements, and the next one, which is going to be called a matched pairs design. Okay? All of these designs are analyzed using a matched T test. You got that? Okay? So let's talk about this other type of design, a matched pairs design. As we started in the beginning by saying the two sets of scores are related. That's why we're doing this kind of T test. Right? In a repeated measures design, it's really easy to see how the scores are related. You're measuring the same person more than once. So their scores are going to be similar. Like, um, you know, if you measure somebody's information, somebody's um, memory for words now, and you measure them next week, chances are they're going to be similar because it's the same person. That's why there's a correlation there. Okay, sometimes you cannot use the same people. You know, let's say I'm going to teach children how to read, and I have two different uh, ways of teaching them, whole word and phonics, all right? I can't teach the children, and I want to see which is better. I can't teach children how to read with phonics and then teach them how to read with whole word. You can't do that. But I still might want to use this kind of um, t-test and the relationship between the two sets of scores. So in that case, I use different sets of kids who are matched in some ways, matched, related, correlated, dependent, okay? They're related in some way. I mean, the classic case of a matched pair's design, twin studies, twin studies, identical twins, right? Because in theory, these identical twins are generally matched on so many variables, including their DNA. So what you do is something like this. You have a group of kids. And let's say you take two kids. Let's say you're um, going to teach two different ways of learning algebra. All right? So what I'm looking for are variables that are relevant to algebra to match these kids on. So what are variables that might be relevant for something like this? What would you want, it, what would you want these kids to be matched on? 
Yeah. Algebra testing? They haven't learned algebra yet, but you're on the right track. <laughs> yeah, maybe general math ability, right? What else might you match on? Yeah. Age. Okay. Maybe school. Maybe school district. Maybe socioeconomic level. There's a wide variety of variables that you might be able to match these kids on. So it would go something like this. Let's say I'm just matching IQ, right? Let's say I'm just matching on IQ, all right? So I have this pool of kids. I take the two kids who have the closest IQs to each other. They're matched. That is one matched pair. Then I randomly assign them to each of the algebra teaching methods. Then I take the next pair the, whose IQs are closely related, right? They're very close in score. And I randomly assign them, right? So then what I'm left with is two sets of scores that are matched in some way. They're matched in IQ. So that if I have one really high IQ in this group, I have another high IQ in the other group. All right? So that's a matched pairs design. And you analyze it with a matched T test. It's the same thing. And you do this when you don't have the ability to measure the same people more than once. Okay. Let's do an example. So here's our example. A researcher is interested in whether students who study with music playing devote as much attention to their studies as students who study under quiet conditions. How many of you listen to music when you study? Interesting. And so how many don't? Don't listen. Interesting. Interesting. The other class was much more 50-50. You guys seem overwhelmingly not into music while you're studying. But oh, maybe I'll look at the grades and see if there's a difference. OK. So 14 students are matched on what? School grades and IQ. Let me take a moment here. We match them on variables that are relevant to the study. Okay? You don't need to match them on things that are irrelevant. Like, I'm not going to match them on eye color. Okay? So, and often it's hard to match them on multiple variables. So you have to pick which ones seem to be real important. All right? So, and so they're, they're matched and then randomly assigned to each group. So they're assigned to either a music group or a no music group given some information to study, and then they're tested on it. So these are their test scores. These are their test scores. OK? So now we're going to see, is there a difference uh, between studying with music or without music? OK? So let's just get to the test. <coughs> First of all, what's the hypothesis here? Anybody remember what our? Null hypothesis is for a matched T test, yeah. No, because that's correlation. No? Well, in words even, what are you testing here? What's my null hypothesis in words? There's no difference in the test scores as a function of whether in the music group or no music group. Right? In symbols, what was different about this hypothesis than chapter 7? Anybody? No? You're like, oh, yeah, right. OK. What does mu sub d stand for? The mean of the different scores, the population mean of the different scores. So here, the population mean of the difference scores is 0. There's no difference. Okay? And the alternative would be that it's not equal to 0. So this is, what kind of hypothesis is this? Directional or non-directional? Non-directional. So therefore, one or two tailed? Two tailed. OK, good. So what do we need? We're going to calculate this. T test, let's write the formula. Okay. So what do I need here? I mean I give you data. What parts do you need? 
I need the standard deviation of the d-scores. What else do I need? Folks, I won't do examples if people aren't going to like participate because it's like so boring. <coughs> what do I need here? Look at a formula and decide. Thank you, yes. How about the D bar, right? The average of the D scores. How do I get that? It's the same as getting a mean of X scores, right? It's just the sum of the D scores divided by N. So I give you that already. <coughs> What's N here? Yeah, good, thanks. Right, the number of pairs of scores. <coughs> okay. Now, the fact that it's negative, what does that mean? What does that tell me, the fact that, that the mean of the d-scores is negative? <clears throat> what does it matter that it's negative? What does negative tell me here? OK, folks, you need to wake up. I mean, I'll put an answer up there. I'll just go on to concepts, really. Think, think, think. What does the negative sign mean for the mean, the mean of the different scores? Yeah. Yeah, right? It means that. The first set of scores is lower than the second set of scores, yes? You understanding that? OK. So now we need to get the standard deviation of the scores. That's the standard deviation of the different scores. So now our t test. Now what? Yeah, t critical value. What do I need for my t critical value? <coughs> to find the t critical value? Degrees of freedom, good. So what are the degrees of freedom for this? Six, Six. yeah, right, it's n minus one. So my t critical value is? Is that? Okay. So what's my decision? Do I reject or fail to reject? Reject, which means what? Yeah, music made a difference. Music made a difference. In what direction? Yeah, the kids who listened to music did somewhat worse. Now, look at that mean difference. OK, we found significance, right? So the temptation is to say, oh, music makes a difference when I'm studying. right? 
But look at the difference. What is the difference? At least our point estimate here. <coughs> yeah, one and a half points. OK? That speaks to effect size. We haven't calculated effect size, but the mean gives you a kind of idea of effect size. So do we think that that's a big difference or not? Well, maybe not. Maybe not enough to get you to stop listening to music. OK? So the difference between significance and effect, yeah? Wait, what did you say one and a half points? Minus 1.4286. Yeah, he just rounded it. <coughs> OK, questions on this? Questions where any of the numbers came from? It's pretty straightforward. OK. Just to let you know, there is a formula in the book called the raw score formula for the, this t-test. Don't use it. I don't want you to use it. I don't like the structure of it because most of your t-tests so far have been structured as differences between means. And what's the denominator? Standard error, right? Or standard error of the difference between the means. The t-test for uh, this raw formula, raw score formula test, changes the structure. So I don't like it. I don't find it particularly useful. So you don't need to do that. <coughs> OK. So we know how to conduct a t-test. Now we're going to calculate a confidence interval. Confidence interval, right? Because the confidence interval is going to give me an estimate, an interval estimate, a range of values, which I think will contain the population mean difference. It'll give me how good that difference is, how precise that estimate is. And I can do the hypothesis test at the same time. So that's quite simple. We've done it before. Okay. Let's do a 95% confidence interval on what we just did. So notice, right, we start out with our point estimate. What's our point estimate here? The mean of the difference scores. Plus or minus a certain amount, which is our critical value times our standard error. Okay? So we have all this information. What's my T critical value? Yeah, 2.447. Because it's a 95% confidence interval, and we had alpha of 0.05 before. What's my standard error? <coughs> no, but thank you for saying that. Negative nope. Oh, we yeah, that's right. What did you have? You had the standard deviation. Where is the standard error? It's the denominator. It's this. Okay, we didn't calculate that straight out. But that's often why we do it. So that's the standard error, and the standard error is 0.528. By the way, you could do this all in absolute value for the mean, and then you get rid of the negative signs, that would be OK. Yeah? Where did you find the standard error again? You said denominator, but I just put it. The denominator oh, of your chief. Yeah. OK. <coughs> OK, so what's the interpretation of this confidence interval? And again, it might be worth your while here to think of it in absolute value terms, because we don't think of negative points. All that's indicating is the direction that it fell out in. But what's the interpretation for this? I'm 95% confident that what? Yeah, thanks. Good, good, right? OK, and let's, let's put them in positive uh, points. Just like I said, we can think of it in absolute value. I'm 95% confident that 0.14 to 2.72 contains the population mean difference in score. between studying with music and without music. 
Hang on just a second. Is that okay? <coughs> okay, yeah, go ahead. Okay, yeah, so that's the next question, okay? All right, so that's the interpretation. We constructed the interval, we did the interpretation, now we want to do the hypothesis test, okay? How do I do a hypothesis test with this interval? Yeah. Yeah, why zero? You're right, why zero? Exactly, exactly. Our hypothesized null value is zero. So we see whether zero is in that interval or not. So what's our conclusion? We reject, we reject. Look, th look at something, look how close that is. Okay, and all you're saying is that you think that the difference between listening to music and not listening to music is somewhere between 0.14 of a point and 2.72 points. It's not, we're not talking about a big effect size here. Okay? Does so everybody understand that? That's why it's so important to do significance tests and maybe an effect size or a confidence interval. All right? That's why. And by the way, it's becoming much bigger now. Uh, the APA manual that just came out encourages it even more than they used to. So you might want to get it into your brains that you're going to have to do this at some point. Okay? Questions on any of that? By the way, if you did a 99% confidence interval for this, what would you change? Just the critical value. What would, happen to the con what would happen to the width of the confidence interval? It would get wider. You know what would happen if you did a 99% confidence interval? You'd fail to reject. You'd fail to reject. Because it would be just wider enough that it would include zero. <coughs> okay, assumptions of the match T test. So notice they're the same as for a one sample test. First one, normality. Normality of the different scores. The different scores should be normally distributed. If your sample size is less than about 30, and the distribution is very non-normal, okay? Then you really should use a non-parametric test like Wilcoxon sign rank test or just the sign test. Those are just different non-parametric options when you have something like this, but it's not meeting the assumptions. Again, we're not going to be looking at all these individual tests, but you should know that they're there in case you come up against it. Uh, second assumption here, independent random sampling. What's independent? Not the sets of scores, right? Because those are dependent, they're related. What's independent is that each pair is independent of the other pairs. Okay, ideally selected at random. And members of a pair should be randomly assigned to the condition. Okay, so now we're going back to varieties of designs. Varieties of designs for the match T test. Okay, so again, so this is the match T test. So, what kind of designs can you have? You can have repeated measures or you can have matched pairs. Under repeated measures, we have simultaneous, successive, Right, simultaneous we talked about. Successive, I mentioned. A before-after design is a type of successive measurement. Okay? Now, the problem with a before-after design, what was our big problem with a before-after design? What was the big problem with a before-after design? Yeah. Yeah, there's no control. There's no control. So that's an issue. Um, that was one type of successive design. The other type of successive design, again, successive presentation, is something called counterbalance. Now, this is the problem, all right? If you're presenting things successively, you're presenting them in an order, right? You have to present one, and then you present the other. Now, the problem becomes, if you're always presenting something in the same order, we can wind up with something called order effects, 
right? If you present something to each person who walks in in the same order, you might have order <laughs> effects. There's two types of order effects. Right? One are called simple order effects. Simple order effects. Examples of simple order effects are things like practice and fatigue. Practice and fatigue. So what's practice? Well, for example, in psychophysics experiments, you might do the same task thousands of trials. Why? Because people get better. People get better. So you do thousands of trials until you plateau out, and you know you're not going to get any better. So they know that you're gonna, that's your level. Because everything up until that is practice. You get better as you do it. Okay, So that's a practice effect. So that can happen if you're presenting things in a particular <coughs> order. What's a fatigue effect? Well, you're doing something for thousands of trials, and then you get tired, and then people don't do as well. Okay? Um, so, and that's down on the other end of the spectrum. So practice and fatigue are problems that can come with order effects. So one way to fix that is something called counterbalancing. Counterbalancing. What does counterbalancing mean? Counterbalancing means I present A, and then I present B to the person who comes in. The next person comes in, I present B, and then I present A. Third person comes in, I do A, B. Fourth person comes in, I do B, A. Okay, They're counterbalanced. That helps to get rid of simple order effects. Simple order effects. Sometimes, however, we have order effects that are not simple. Those are called carryover effects. And carryover effects, like the name implies, they're effects that carry over from one condition to the next condition. Like if you're doing a vision study, sometimes you're looking at a stimulus and certain retinal receptors get bleached out. So then you have to wait some time before you could look at another stimulus. So that could be a carryover effect. Here's an example of a carryover effect, another one. Uh, when I tested babies, one project we did, we showed babies happy faces, sad faces, angry faces. Well, when the babies saw the happy faces, yeah, that was fine. You know, when they saw the sad faces, OK, whatever. Some babies, when we showed them the angry faces, screamed. They screamed. They were not happy. So that was the end of testing for the day. You know? So that is a carryover effect, because it was going to carry over into the next things. So we had, you know, there's a problem. If your carryover effects are bad and asymmetric, they go in one direction but not in the other, then sometimes you have to use different subjects. That would be a matched design. You'd have to use different subjects. But sometimes you can fix it with simple things, like just putting time in between presentations or a distractor stimulus or something like that. <coughs> so sometimes you can fix it. But if you can't fix it, then you have to do a uh, matched pairs design. All right? So, that, so counterbalancing does not fix this. Counterbalancing does not fix this. Yeah? Sorry, can Counterbalancing does not, affect, does not fix carryover effects. Counterbalancing can fix simple effects, not carryover effects. Right? Because if the problem is the kid seeing an angry face, it doesn't matter where they're presented. Like they can't, it'll affect what the next thing is that they do. It's just, just not going to help. Okay? So those, let's see if there's anything else I want to talk about with that. All right. There's two different types of match pairs designs that you could talk about, or two main subtypes. One is experimental, right? You create the matching of these groups, whether through pretests or whether he talks about perhaps rated by judges. What he means is, let's say you have a group of people and you show them a whole slew of faces. But one group, you tell them these people are smart, and the other group, you tell them they're not smart. So then what you've done is you've matched the people because everybody's seeing the same faces. And then you're separating them by what instruction you gave them. Okay, that's, that's what he means when he's talking about that. Otherwise, yeah, you're matching on some kind of other variables. All right? The other type 
is naturally occurring. You have pairs that are naturally occurring. Spouses, siblings, maybe roommates, office mates. Okay? So you can do this. The problem is that you have to be cautious with its conclusions. All right? So in general, if repeated measures is appropriate, it's the best. Why? Because you can use fewer subjects. This is always a nice thing when you can use fewer subjects for a good amount of power. And if you can't use the same subjects, then matched pairs is good. If you can match them in some way. All right? Any questions on that? Let's see. Okay, so now we are up to chapter 12. <laughs> so you know how to do these tests with one group. We've learned pretty much all you need to know about two groups. What are we going to be looking at now? Three or more groups. From here on in, it's three or more. And you could have a study that has four or five or ten. Doesn't matter. <coughs> okay? So you're going to have to learn a different technique to deal with this. Here's the example. Let's talk about an example. A researcher is interested in comparing three different types of therapy to alleviate phobias. Okay. One is regular talk therapy, counseling. One is something called systematic desensitization. For the non-psych majors out there, is there somebody who wants to tell me what systematic desensitization is? Yeah. Yeah, pretty much. Um, often it involves like a relaxation technique with increasing increments of the thing you're afraid of. So that's systematic desensitization. Okay? What about counter conditioning? Anybody know what counter conditioning is? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, actually, that's exactly what it is. It's a learning paradigm. So, for example, if a kid is afraid of a dog, is afraid of dogs, right? So, what you might do is have the child in a room with a dog and their favorite toy or their blankie. Because what you're trying to do is change the response from fear. You're trying to associate the nice response of the toy to counter the response of fear to the dog. Okay, so that's counter conditioning. So those are three types of ways that uh, people could deal with phobias. So you would want to know, is there a difference in these um, types in terms of, you know, is one better than another? By the way, this is an increasingly pertinent question because insurance companies, their big question is, okay, what are we going to give money for, right? So what they want are research-based or evidence-based techniques that work. So they might say, oh, OK, we will pay for systematic desensitization, but we're not going to pay for counseling for a phobia. Okay? So this is a really pertinent question. All right, so now we have three groups. So how many hypotheses are we actually testing? Well, we're actually testing three, right? I want to know if counseling is the same as systematic desensitization. I want to know if counseling is the same as counter conditioning. And I want to know if systematic desensitization is the same as counter conditioning. Okay, so those are three different hypotheses. Now, what would you like to do? Because I'm just taking these two groups at a time. What's the inclination? Just do three T tests, right? Why can't I just do three T tests? Okay? Well, you can't. You can't. I will talk more about it for chapter 13 as to why you can't just do more t-tests. 
But here's the bottom line. I'm going to give you the bottom line now, and I'll give you a more detailed explanation for the next chapter. If you increase the number of t-tests in your study, you also increase the type 1 error rate. You increase alpha, unless you fix it. And that, that's a whole different chapter. So you increase the type 1 error rate. So we can't just throw t-tests at it. That's not going to work. So we need a different way of tackling this. The technique we're going to learn that's in this chapter is something called ANOVA, which is an, ana which is an anacronym for analysis of variance. Analysis of variance. <coughs> analysis of variance. OK? So I'm going to have to throw some terms at you because we're going to change things around a little. I have these three groups, right? I have these three groups, but it's still one variable. All right? It's one variable. It's just three different levels of the same variable. And it's my independent variable. In the context of ANOVA, we call a variable, the independent variable, a factor. So you're going to hear me now, instead of talking about independent variables, you're going to hear me talking about factors. This chapter deals with one factor. One factor. One factor, but more than two levels. Okay? In this chapter, what we're dealing with also is that each group will have independent participants of the other groups. Right? They're not related. So this is going to be an independent group's ANOVA for this chapter. Specifically, we'll call it a one-way independent group's ANOVA. A one-way. One-way means one factor. One way means one factor. So one way, independent groups, analysis of variance. <coughs> Just to let you know, so we're doing a one way. We're also going to do a two way. That's two factors. And we're going to do a repeated measures, <coughs> which is the same people measured more than twice. OK? So. This analysis of variance, we're going to talk about how we get there. I want to show you something really briefly. It's in your book. You don't need to write it down. You don't have a slide for it. I just wanted to show you, OK? Because what we have is a t-test. And this is the problem, right? When we had a t-test, what was in the numerator of our t-test when we had two groups? The numerator of a t-test for two groups. Yeah, just the difference between the means, right? We're always trying to consolidate differences between groups down to a number. When we had one group, the number we looked at was the mean. When we had two groups, the number we looked at was the difference between the means. Okay? So now I'm going to have three or more groups. What number do I consolidate that into? Well, what we're going to consolidate it into is a variance. Because right? I have more than two, so it's going to be a variance. So that's why this is called analysis of variance. Now, this is just really briefly how you get from a t-test to an ANOVA. <coughs> this formula, you're not going to use that formula to calculate anything. Okay? I'm going to talk about it. I'm going to explain what's going on in it, but you're not going to use it to calculate anything. So this is my basic t-test. If I assume my ends are the same, I can transform it. All right, algebraically, I'm just transforming it. What I've done here is square both sides to set it up this way, and I'm changing it around so that finally I get to, be, I get to here. That t squared equals this. Why have I changed it into this? Because this is a bizarre form, but it's going to be the form of our next test statistic. The net, right? t is a test statistic, z is a test statistic. Our next test statistic is something called f. And f is equal to t squared, OK, when you have two groups. Sorry. <coughs> so what I'm going to talk about 
is the numerator and the denominator of this, this formula. Like I said, you're not going to use it for calculations, but it's to show you what exactly is going on in an analysis of variance. Okay. Notice the denominator. You know that denominator. What's the denominator? S squared P, what is it? It's a pooled variance, right? A pooled variance. And what does a pooled variance mean? It's a weighted average, right? It's a weighted average of the variances. You know, if I have two groups, I just, you know, if the two groups have the same sample size, I'm just taking the average of those variances to get one measure, one measure of pooled variance. That's all it is. In the context of ANOVA, where I have three or more, it's going to be the same idea. It's going to be the same idea. And if the sample sizes are all the same, you could, just, you could just take the average of the variances to get that one measure. Now, within the context of ANOVA, we, we will talk about it as a variance, but it's not going to be this pooled variance anymore. It's going to be something called mean square. If you remember, back in chapter 3, when we first learned variance, another name for variance was mean square. Mean square. In ANOVA, we generally talk about mean squares. So the mean square and the denominator of this, of this F test, which is what it's going to be, is something called mean square within, MSW, subscript W, MS within. Because remember what your pooled variance is, right? Your pooled variance is the variance of all these groups averaged together. But what is the variance? It's essentially noise. Right? It's essentially noise. But it's the variability within each of the groups. So MS within is the variance within the groups. OK, that's this. See? MS within. The numerator that I showed you before Usually, it would be just the difference between the means. But we can't do that anymore. So it's going to have to be a variance among those means. So it's again, it's a measure of variability using the means, or a measure of variability across the groups, between the groups. So that means that that numerator is going to be called MS between. MS between. So we have these two measures of variance. In the numerator is going to be MS between, and in the denominator is going to be MS within. These will give us something called the F ratio. Okay? This is how you're going to calculate it, or part of how you're going to calculate it. Okay? So F is a test statistic. Again, we're taking raw numbers. We're going to transform them into F, which is this test statistic. And then we're going to look it up on an F table, an F distribution to see whether there's significance or not. But let's talk about this some more. <coughs> when the null hypothesis is true, the F ratio follows a probability distribution called the F distribution. The F ratio increases as the separations between the means gets larger relative to the variability within the groups. OK, here's an analogy, a metaphor that I, want, that I hope will be useful for you. When you're listening to the radio, OK, you're listening to music in a car. And I don't know if any of you actually listen to radios anymore, but OK. Um, and you hear music, and sometimes you hear static, right? The music we can think of as a signal, and the static we can think of as noise. Now, what your ear does automatically, because it's this perfect analyzer, is it just breaks it down. Even though the sound wave hitting your ear is one wave, your ear breaks it down into, oh, this is the signal, and this is the noise, OK? As you drive further away from the radio station, what happens? What happens to the signal? It gets weaker, and the static, the noise, gets higher. Right? OK. So let's take this idea of signal and noise and apply it to what we're talking about here. MS between reflects the variability with, uh, across these groups, between these groups. All right? 
if the groups are very different from each other. Let's say, let's say um, counter conditioning was way better than the other two. Then that means that there's a big difference between the means here or a large signal. A signal, right? There's an actual difference there. That's a signal. But the means are not perfect predictors of everybody within a group, so there's still some noise. So you can think of this numerator. If my pen works, as signal and noise. Right? The signal is differences between means if it's there. And the noise is just actual variability. What is MS within? MS within is just noise. It's just the static. <coughs> Okay, so understand something. If the null hypothesis is true, if the null hypothesis is true, is there a signal or is there no signal then? Let's, let's write down what the null hypothesis is. For three groups, you could write it like this. You don't have to write that equals mu on the end. I think he does in the book. I generally don't, but either way is okay with me. That's my null hypothesis, that these three groups, there's no difference among these groups. And of course, if it was four or five groups, you would add those in, but it's the same basic idea. If my null hypothesis is true, do I have a, a signal, that metaphoric signal? No, right? Because all the groups are the same. All the groups are the same. If that's the case, and there's no signal, when the null hypothesis is true, what is my F ratio going to be approximately? One. Yeah. OK. So one of the things we're looking at is how far away that F ratio is from one. Now again, in statistics, when we talk about things being the same, you know there's a lot of slop, right? So if something is 1.5 or 2 or even 3, that still may be considered close enough to one that we can't say it's chance. But that's what we're looking at. Now, the stronger your signal, what does the stronger your signal mean? <coughs> the further apart the means are from each other. What's going to happen to my F ratio? Again, assuming all things being the same, as the differences between the means get bigger, what will happen to my F ratio? it'll get bigger, right? Because in this case, I'm saying if this signal gets bigger, all else being the same, then this F ratio will get bigger. Whereas if the signal is very is slight, right? The groups are different from each other, but not all that different, then depending on how much noise there is, you may not detect it, right? There may be so much noise or so much static that you can't find the pattern of differences. That happens. Okay? This is essentially what your F ratio is doing. Now, I have to talk about this bit conceptually. You have to understand this. A ratio will follow the F distribution when both the numerator and the denominator are independent estimates of the same population variance. Okay, what does that mean? If the null hypothesis is true, those three groups essentially belong to the same population, right? We've talked about those words before. You know, if the groups are not different from each other, we say, oh, yeah, they really belong to the same population. So three groups belong to the same population. If that's the case, there's one variance for that overall population, just one variance. So in that case, the numerator and the denominator are both what we call independent estimates of that variance. So it's the, the denominator seems obvious, right? MS within, we know what that is. It's a variance. It's a pool variance. That's fine. So that seems obvious as to why that's an independent estimate. And look, what do we assume? We do have to assume homogeneity of variance in order to make this assumption. All right? If you can assume homogeneity of variance, 
then MS Within gives the best estimate of it. So it's just an estimate of that overall population variance. Okay, that's all it is. That's all we're talking about. So that's the denominator. What about the numerator, MS Between? How is MS Between an estimate of the population variance? Well, the numerator is made up of the variance of the group means. That's essentially what it is. <coughs> right? I have all these different groups. Let's say I have five groups. So I have five means. So I could calculate the variance of the means. That's, that's not the only thing that the numerator is. That's part of it. You have to multiply it by n, but it's essentially this idea of how far apart these means are. Okay? So if we know the population variance, and n, we can determine the variance of the group means. So look at this. You remember this. I'm reasonably sure you remember this. I'm going to use a small n here. All right? What is that a formula for? Standard error. Okay, but we're talking about variances, so I'm going to make it a variance. Okay? And what is a standard error, by the way? I always think you know, but like, what is a standard error? And this is just for one group here. What's a standard error? What does it tell me? Again, what does the standard deviation tell you? Yeah. Well, how far scores are from the mean? Yeah. Well, it's how far the means are from the population mean. Right? Right? Standard error is a measure of variance for means. It was the standard deviation of that sampling distribution. OK? So if I solve here for the variance, which is essentially this, I just cross multiply. So I'm solving for the variance. This is what I have. In order to get this variance, all I did was take the variance of the means and multiply by n. That's what MS between is, essentially. That's essentially what MS between is. So it is also an independent estimate of this. Both MS within and MS between are trying to estimate this overall population variance. MS within uses the variances directly to try to do it. MS between uses the variance of the means to try to do it. So two different ways of trying to do the same thing. Okay? Now MS between, but both of those, MS between and MS within, will only uh, be independent estimates when the null hypothesis is true. That is, there's no signal. When there's no signal, they both estimate this. But when there's a signal, MS between gets bigger because of that signal. The signal being the difference between the groups. OK? Questions? OK. Yeah? You mean this bit, what I did up here? Okay, well, do you, does this make sense? Does this formula make sense to you from this? You followed how you got from there to there? Okay, so all this is saying is, right, this is a variance of the means. <coughs> if you take the variance of the means and you multiply it by n, you'll get this estimate of the population variance. That's all it's saying. But again, only when the null is true, only when there's no additional signal or pattern going on. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. That, yeah, right? This is here, right here. When the null is true, both of them are independent estimates. But again, specified when the null is true. Because if the null is not true, that means those groups are different from each other. 
And there's a pattern of difference in there, or a signal. Okay. Uh, so MS between is an est estimate of the variance only when the null is true. When it's false, the size of MS between reflects the population variance and whatever treatment the groups have undergone. Do you guys have a question? Do you have a question back there? No? OK. So how are we going to do this? And by the way, so that F ratio can be less than 1. It can never be negative. Can you see why it can never be negative? Why can it never be negative? Yeah. Uh, the F ratio. Yeah. Um, no, that would be an interesting thing of thinking about it, but no, it's not that. That's not what will do it. Yeah. <coughs> not even a negative signal. Yeah. No, you can get weird things like that, but think about it. Don't think about the signal and noise analogy. Think about MS between and MS within. Yeah, the variances. The variances. Because they're variances, they can never be negative. They're squared. Okay? So now we're going to talk about the F distribution. Right? We've talked about the Z distribution and the T distribution. Now we talk about the F distribution. The shape of an F distribution is positively skewed. Something like that. It's not normal. It's a positively skewed distribution. <coughs> and actually, like T, right, it has, it's a family of distributions. What was T based on? What was T? Yeah, degrees of freedom, OK? But we only had one set of degrees of freedom. With an F distribution, there's going to be two sets of degrees of freedom. One set of degre one degrees of freedom for the numerator and degrees of freedom for the denominator. Right? Because remember, why is it degrees of freedom from the numerator and denominator? They're both variances. How do you get a variance? How do you ever get a variance? The generic formula. Variance. Yeah, sum of squares divided by degrees of freedom. Sum of squares divided by degrees of freedom. So there are degrees of freedom that go into the numerator and degrees of freedom that go into the denominator. As your n increases, the f becomes less skewed. If your n increases a lot, then it becomes much less skewed. So. The degrees of freedom that we're going to look it up, and I'm going to show you what an F table looks like in a minute, are degrees of freedom between, that's the numerator, is k minus 1. What does k mean? The number of groups. The number of groups. Degrees of freedom within is nt minus k. What does nt stand for? The total number of observations. The total number of observations. We're going to have a degrees of freedom total. These are not going to be used to look up anything in a table. But it's like a good little factoid to know. NT minus 1. So let's just take a look quickly at our F distribution. Now, in the back of the book, there are three pages of Fs. One is for 0.05, one is for 0.01, and one is for 0.025. You're not going to use the 0.025 page. You would either use 0.05 or 0.01. Um, and so what we have here, degrees of freedom for the numerator going across, degrees of freedom for the denominator going down in this body. Those are your F critical values. Your F critical values. OK?
And you notice, as always, as your degrees of freedom for the denominator, that's your sample size, is increasing, your, um, your F critical values are getting smaller. Okay, I think we are done with this today.